Good morning, everyone, and, and thank you for joining us. My name is Michael Fotheringham. I'm the Chief Executive of the Australian Housing and Urban Research Institute, AHURI, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the fourth installation of the AHURI webinar, research webinar series. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that I'm hosting this webinar from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you all work today, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this webinar. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters throughout Australia. Now, who is pleased to be offered this research webinar series as a means of keeping you informed of our latest research and to help you engage with research findings from our ongoing program of research at a time when our public face-to-face -face conference and events program is, of course, still on hold. And your response has been really encouraging with over 530 registered for the conference for the webinar today. Today is our fourth instalment in the series. And if you're interested in the previous webinars, uh, the recordings are freely available on the Uhuri website. And before we meet today's presenters, and I introduce you to the topic for today's webinar, I wanna just take a moment to introduce you to Uhuri's National Cities Strategic Research Agenda, which officially launched last week. As part of a Hurry strategic plan, we've committed to developing a program of research to explore the, the many issues facing Australian cities today. Expensive housing markets, extensive geographic spread, high carbon intensity and resource consumption, rapid population growth, changing transport needs, and of course, the coronavirus pandemic. It's our ambition to provide Australian cities an urban policy research, uh, urban policy research with the same coordinated focus, engagement with the policy community and impact we currently bring to housing and homelessness research. The launch of this strategic research agenda and our website hub is the first step into our journey to deliver the National Cities Research Program. So after the webinar, take some time and explore the, the new Cities and Urban Hub of the Uhuri website. It showcases 12 key themes we've identified that either define current urban policy thinking in Australia, or that we believe should be considered part of the policy focus as a nation moving. If your organisation is interested in partnering with Uhuri to deliver a, cities, a future cities research program, I'd invite you to contact us and start a conversation. Right, before I introduce today's topic and speakers, I need to provide you with some instructions on the software and some housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded, so if you need to leave or you're getting distracted by homeschooling arrangements, or for that matter, if you want to return to it later or forward it on to a colleague, the recording will be on the Uhuri website in the coming days. And at the end of today's webinar, you'll receive a survey. We really do welcome your feedback so that we can refine and improve future webinars and ensure that we're presenting information in a way that's useful to you. Now, in terms of participating in today's webinar, here's some instructions. By default, you're listening through your computer speaker system or headphones, but if you prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone on your screen um, and the audio pane and um, the dial-in information will be displayed for you you'll have the opportunities to submit questions uh, by typing them in the questions section um, of the control panel. And you can submit your questions at any time during the presentation. We'll collate these and address as many of them as we can during the Q&A segment following today's presentation. But do please disregard the raise your hand function as we're not gonna be using that today. Now, today's topic and presenters. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar connecting affordable housing and jobs in Australian cities. And I want to acknowledge the generous support of the Housing Industry Association, our exclusive sponsors of today's webinar. In supporting today's webinar, the HIA believe that maintaining housing supply in every part of the housing spectrum, from public to private, is, is a key to supporting access to safe, decent and affordable housing options for all Australians. And I thank them for their support. Our presenters today are Dr. Madeline Pill from the University of Sheffield, and Professor Nicole Gurren from the University of Sydney, the, author, the authors of the Uhuri Report, Strategic Planning, City Deals and Affordable Housing, which is the basis for today's webinar. The report, along with the Policy Evidence Summary and Standalone Executive Summary, are now available on the Uhuri website. The address is there on your screen. I'll resist the temptation to give an introduction to the topic itself, as, as they'll both do that very well shortly. During her tenure, oh, Professor Gurren, during her tenure, sorry, Dr. Madeline Pill, during her tenure um, at the University of Sydney, was a senior lecturer in public policy and is now at the University of Sheffield. 
um, where she has recently returned as uh, in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning, where she's Deputy Director. We're also privileged to have with us Professor Nicole Gurren, Professor of Urban and Regional Planning at the University of Sydney, where she directs the University's Research Centre, the Hurry Research Centre. Her research focuses on intersections between urban planning and the housing system, and she's led and collaborated on a series of studies on aspects of urban policy, housing, sustainability, and planning funded by Uhuri as well as state and local governments. We welcome both Madeline and Nicole. And it's now my pleasure to hand over to Madeline Hill. Thanks very much, Michael, and to um, everyone for coming along. And thanks also to Uhuri for supporting us in this research and for arranging this today. It's a really great opportunity to um, tell you a bit about our research and then have plenty of time for questions and comments um, following our presentation. Um, so, um, Katerina, if you could go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so this is the structure of the content that we'll talk about today. But as Michael has said, um, the full report and summary and policy um, recommendations report are available on the HUI website. So um, what we'll do is Nicole will initially just locate this particular research project within the context of the larger AHUI inquiry of which it forms a part. Then I'll explain this project's research question and the approach that we took to providing answers to this. Um, I'll then explain what we did in terms of our first stage research, which was a review of international evidence. Subsequently, I'll talk through the second stage of our research, which is a review of Australian strategic planning frameworks, including the potential role of satellite cities within their broader metropolitan areas. And then finally, I'll hand over to Nicole, who will explain stage three of the research, which was about addressing housing supply and job opportunity mismatches, policy development options, and some key takeaways. So as I said, we're hoping to have um, plenty of time for kind of Q&A after that. And um, thanks, Katerina. I'll hand over to um, Nicole for a bit of context on the inquiry. Uh, if we can have the next slide, Katerina. Thanks, Thank Madeline, and, and thanks, Michael. Yes, so as Madeline said, this uh, particular study that we're going to talk about this morning fit within a wider Uhuri inquiry that looked at urban productivity and affordable rental supply, essentially asking how affordable rental housing supply, and when we say affordable rental housing supply, we were looking particularly at the Q2, so low income earners, not the very, very low income earners who traditionally have been housed um, in social housing, but that next tier up, which is very critical for the workforce actually, low income workers on around 35,000 per year, low income, um, households on around 35,000 to around 62,000 um, a year in the um, 2016 census was the reference point. And so the question was for that sector um, of the population, which particularly tends to be in low paid jobs, but uh, jobs that are very critical uh, for the economy, the relationship between the availability of affordable rental housing, labour markets and urban productivity and whether our existing and potential strategic planning and funding interventions within metropolitan areas and potentially non-metropolitan areas are supporting that connection between the availability of affordable rental housing and accessibility to jobs. And this was very much um, within the wider awareness, I'm sure all of the audience members are only too aware of that growing mismatch that we've had in Australia between the locations of employment opportunity and the geography of affordable rental housing and those two things going in the opposite direction, if we can put it very simply. And, the, and we were interrogating that in this wider inquiry and asking what are the implications for urban productivity in terms of the labour market depth and flexibility, so 
the, um, the variety of workers able to uh, participate um, in, in major employment centres and able to relocate to those centres, as well as participation rates, because if people aren't able to access homes near employment opportunities, particularly uh, for women, there's been some evidence internationally to show lower uh, levels of labour market participation. And um, the wider question um, that we look at, particularly in this research project, is we know we're doing a lot in cities. We know we're trying to invest in increasing infrastructure and certainly we have um, comprehensive strategic planning frameworks for all of the metropolitan set centres and in fact our regions in Australia. But to what extent are those strategic funding interventions and planning frameworks getting at that particular issue around affordable rental housing for that critical sector of the workforce. Our next slide please, Katerina. And so just to conceptualise for a moment that relationship between urban productivity increasingly concentrated in major city centres, um, the implications between um, the location and number of firms and we know that there's been an increased um, tendency towards clustering of high value employment opportunities as, as, uh, as economies have changed and in space that's meant greater central city clustering. And the implications for labour market depth and mobility, so we see a clustering of firms to take, a to take advantage of the diversity, diversity of the labour market that you get in central city areas. But for housing, we know that what that's meant is that homes that are located in proximity to those employment centres, um, rents and prices rise, and that critical lower income sector of the workforce misses out. Now, the ways that we can address that potential mismatch is either by connecting existing areas of affordable rental housing better to those employment opportunities through infrastructure investment in transport or internet connectivity, or it's about making sure that there's more affordable rental housing that's available in areas that are near jobs, so that's in high value markets, or potentially it's actually encouraging more job growth in areas where affordable rental housing already exists. And so the wider mm -hmm. inquiry is looking at all of those relationships and asking what workers are doing, what firms are doing, and what strategic uh, interventions might help um, improve that relationship between jobs and housing. And it's back over to you, Madeline, for this project. Next slide, please, Katarina. Thanks, Nicole. You can see it was um, quite an ambitious inquiry that uh, Nicole very ably held. This particular research we're talking about today was the third out of four constituent projects within this inquiry. And as Nicole's just mentioned, our overarching research question for this particular project was how can strategic spatial planning and funding interventions leverage affordable rental housing choices near employment, enhancing urban productivity? And just to reiterate, we were focused on the second lowest income quintile households in terms of national, this is where I lose, it, it was gross household income, um, uh, the, the, that, that second lowest quintile. So to start to unpick this research question, I think it's useful first just to say a few words about the kind of international landscape. And internationally, it's really clear that against the backdrop discourse at minimum about decentralisation and of multi-level governance and increasingly in Australia too strategic funding interventions like city deals have emerged as targeted place-based models seeking to catalyse economic development through investment through infrastructure supporting jobs housing and connectivity so it's kind of picking up on that diagram that Nicole just brought through in terms of the basis for the inquiry. So in this particular project, we examined international and Australian practice in using such place-based interventions within wider strategic planning frameworks to 
for supporting employment and housing growth. We assessed how strategic interventions can best leverage affordable rental housing choices near employment to enhance urban productivity. So we had three more detailed questions which guided the project, which are set out here. Firstly, we identified the key features of strategic city or place-based funding approaches in practice as well, used in the UK, in Europe and in North America. Our focus was on interventions around infrastructure and housing, and we looked at governance, funding, implementation, performance measures, and any outcomes that had already occurred. Though in actuality, because they're emergent practices, a lot of this is still very much in train, not only in Australia, but elsewhere where such approaches are being deployed. We identified lessons for Australia in the context of this emergent practice. Secondly, we assess to what extent current Australian capital city planning frameworks integrate strategies for housing affordability, transport connectivity and employment growth, including strategies for increasing affordable rental housing supply near employment opportunities and for increasing connectivity and employment opportunities in lower cost housing markets. So again, we were trying to unpick in terms of that conceptual diagram that Nicole just uh, showed you. And then finally, thirdly, we identified housing supply and job opportunity mismatches for low income households in our four case study areas. So our study focused on four areas, Sydney, Melbourne, and also the satellite cities of Wollongong and Geelong. And we'll, we'll come back to that. We considered, in light of our research, the potential strategies to support more balanced housing supply and employment growth in these four areas, but obviously would be applicable um, more generally as well. Thanks very much, Katerina. If we could have the next slide. Great. So actually, to kind of try and start tackling these questions, our research approach was as follows. Our research was conducted in 2018 and 2019, so I think that's something to bear in mind in terms of our presentation. And I think in the Q&A, hopefully, it would be interesting to get a chance to discuss what the implications are of sort of more recent events uh, in Australia and certainly in the UK on on uh, some of the lessons that we can that we can identify. Um, so in the first stage, we did an evidence review of international practice in spatial funding and city deal programs. This was supplemented by interviews with academic and practitioner experts in the UK, given the salience of city deals, given their fast policy transfer to Australia, and regarding the Greater Manchester model, which was cited throughout the SART Cities Plan um, when it was launched in 2016. And actually, there is a case study on the Greater Manchester model, which is appended to the research report that you can download from the AHUI website. In the second stage, we analyse the capital city planning frameworks, particularly in terms of those strategies for connecting employment and housing growth and the role of strategic funding interventions. This, in turn, was supplemented by interviews with 20 state and local planners and economic development officers in our four case study areas. So these interviewees included local government officers in four of the eight constituent local government areas of the Western Sydney City Deal. And we also did interviews with officers in the city of Greater Geelong, which at the time was thinking about the then emergent Geelong City Deal. And then finally, in stage three, we undertook a spatial analysis of rental affordability and employment accessibility, which along with the interviews that we conducted in Australia regarding our case study areas, informed our identification of existing and potential strategic interventions for creating more balanced housing and employment growth. So that's what we did. Thanks, Katerina. We have the next slide. Lovely, thank you. So, I'll first say a few words about the first stage of our research. And this first stage, this international evidence review, really underlined that in essence, place-based deals are intergovernmental contracts. 
typically between higher federal or central government and lower state and local tiers of government. Deals, though, also do provide a basis for engaging non-governmental actors, organisations and agencies in forms of horizontal coordination. This is formalised in the UK through local enterprise partnerships. These are business-led partnerships with local authorities. Um, and in the UK, they can receive certain aspects of this place-based funding, such as growth deals. Overall, the potential of deal making is that it brings together separate powers, responsibilities, funds, programs, and expertise into a package that's cohesive and importantly has the potential to be bespoke is it, as it's designed to reflect place-based conditions and place and the priorities of that place. So that's kind of in theory what this approach offers. In our international evidence review, we found that place-based deals are being deployed to catalyze new investment, to support employment and housing growth, and to improve planning and policy coordination across tiers of government. We really identified in this three primary lessons which are set out on this slide here. Our first lesson is that such interventions focus often on major transport infrastructure. And, that, and this emphasis in place-based deals has meant that benefits to disadvantaged groups are often really unclear. Secondly, we found that to the extent that housing is considered in place-based deals, the emphasis tends to be on overall housing supply targets, which have not translated into improved outcomes for low-income households in private rental. There's a need to consider the potential impact of transport or other major infrastructure investments on housing markets and the potential displacement of low-income renters when housing markets rise due to improved connectivity through major transport infrastructure investment. Thirdly, the primary objectives of funding deals need to be made explicit, as well as frameworks for monitoring and measuring their performance. And governance arrangements, which take time to consolidate, should be robust and transparent. Additional capacity funding for local governments is often needed to help them with the negotiation and with the implementation of deals. This was certainly an issue with the first wave of UK city deals, which was rectified to an extent with dedicated funding in subsequent waves of city deals. Great, thanks, Katerina. Thank you. So what we did in the report, and the report contains a lot more information and accompanying text, but we kind of ended this section of the report with a proposed typology of place-based deals. So apologies for the amount of text here, but it is a useful illustration of how they can have different overarching aims. All of these three types that we identify as feature multi-scale governance arrangements and a mix of funding sources. But a key aspect that, we dis that distinguishes them is, as I said, what they're actually trying to achieve. So we distinguish between those that prioritize economic development, those that focused on community renewal, and those that focused on housing supply, particularly with an aspect of affordability as well. So starting in the first column, deals are designed to support economic development through infrastructure investments which catalyze growth. This is exemplified in the UK city deals and growth deals. Here I should mention that city deals form one of a range of place-based deals and strategic funding mechanisms in the UK. These are summarized in the final report. There's a dedicated table just for that because there's so many different ones. But the point is that these different deals and mechanisms are combined on the ground to form packages of funding and commitments. So if we take Greater Manchester as an example, it's got a city deal, a growth deal, indeed every city deal also has a growth deal for some reason, um, under which the local enterprise partnerships gain funds for 
for projects to benefit their local economies. And there's also five other types of agreement in place. Of note, I think particularly, is the devolution deal, which enables an elected Metro mayor of the combined authority of Greater Manchester, which comprises 10 constituent local governments. And it also transfers powers to the combined authority, both from central government, but also from its constituent local governments. So it's a rescaling of governance by creating these combined authorities. In the middle column, we've got deals which aim to address spatial disadvantage by funding community development initiatives. Examples include the US's long-standing community development block grants, and in Canada, the tripartite, so between federal, state and local government tiers, urban development agreements, which were used between the 1980s until 2010, when there was a change in government, to coordinate funding to address issues, including affordable housing and economic development. This Canadian example of the UDAs really is a good example because it illustrates the strengths of place-based deals, bringing together different tiers of governments and offering a powerful opportunity to drive economic and social outcomes. But these UDAs also illustrate some of the weaknesses of place-based deals, particularly the need for sufficient funding to actually be able to benefit low-income groups and the concomitant need for a long time frame with a committed, consistent with committed, consistent political backing to deliver lasting outcomes at scale. And finally, in the third column, we go to we go, we go to Europe and we go to France. And here we have programs in this column which aim to support significant new housing supply. And France has a wonderful example. It's the Contrat de Développement Territorial, apologies for my pronunciation, which are agreements between central government and local government, the smallest level of local government in France, the communes, in the Ile de France region. So it's essentially Greater Paris. But the catalyst for these agreements was the construction of a transport mega project, the Grand Paris Express which is a 30 billion euro rapid tra transit project due for completion in 2030. So what the CDTs are, are agreements between central government and the communes seeking greater housing supply and economic development opportunities proximate to the new stations in this new um, transport line. The CDTs are envisaged as helping to drive the planned delivery of 70,000 new dwellings a year. Half of the, that, that planned delivery will be in the communes in these local government areas which have CDTs with, with French central government. So importantly as well though, this is supplemented as according to French national law, social housing needs to make up 25% of new housing stock. So therefore, this model and this mode of delivery is where one in which social housing is seen as an integral part of planning for housing, rather than additional extra that's negotiated down the line. And this clearly mitigates the gentrification and displacement that may result from the improved connectivity of such major transport infrastructure. So in a way, that's the most clear model, which is explicitly about affordable housing delivery. Um, thanks, Katerina. We have the next slide. So, turning to the second stage of our research, we then reviewed Australian capital city planning frameworks. These, of course, as you all know, establish the spatial objectives and policies for future growth and future change within established and new development areas. In our review, we found that employment growth, transport connectivity and housing choice or housing affordability are all key objectives of these frameworks. But strategies for integrating these elements are underdeveloped and the need for high levels of coordination and collaboration between state and local agencies is really palpable. We found that frameworks emphasise improving transport connectivity to existing and planned growth areas providing and protecting employment grants, increasing housing densities near existing employment centres and transport nodes, and encouraging jobs growth in sub-regional and local centres. 
We also found, importantly, that there's strong potential for strategic funding interventions such as City Deals to catalyse key elements of these strategic frameworks, as is occurring through the Western Sydney City Deal. These bring employment closer to existing and planned housing. However, specific strategies are needed to ensure that rental accommodation remains affordable and available with these low income Q2, quintile two, lowest um, income households. Thanks very much, Katerina. Um, this is just to give a little taste of the report. This table sets out a summary of our review of the Capital City Strategic Planning Framework for two of our case study areas, Sydney and Melbourne. The full analysis of every state and territory Capital City Framework is in the final report, but I'm focusing here on our case areas. So we found that the frameworks do include new housing supply targets. And actually, when you look across the board, it was only the Greater Adelaide Plan, which was unique in that it specified a target for affordable housing at 15% in all new significant developments. So turning to our case study areas, the Greater Sydney Region Plan does refer to affordable rental housing targets for 5 to 10% of new residential floor space for very low, so that the quintile one, and low income, the quintile two that we've been focused on, households. Mechanisms for implementation, however, have yet to be specified. In 2019, New South Wales Government did establish a new pathway for implementing affordable housing requirements through local planning instruments, as well as guidelines for contribution schemes. Turning to Plan Melbourne, this does refer to increasing social and affordable housing in line with the Homes for Victorian strategy, but it doesn't specify an affordable housing target. Urban renewal processes and the redevelopment of government land are cited as opportunities to support affordable housing outcomes and planning reform to provide a clearer basis for affordable housing contributions through voluntary agreements is foreshadowed in, in the plan. Thanks, Katerina. Lovely, thank you. We also thought about the role of satellite cities in addressing growth and housing affordability pressures in the major cities such as Sydney and Melbourne. Satellite cities, such as our cases of Wollongong in New South Wales and Geelong in Victoria, are located in close proximity to metropolitan areas and have very close economic and transport connections with these, but they remain physically separate. Satellite cities typically offer more affordable rental housing supply, but they have lower job accessibility. They have weaker in local employment opportunities and they have long commuting times to metropolitan centres. The drawing on our interviews in the case areas, we found that satellite cities have lower cost housing markets and can play an important role in offering affordable rental accommodation for lower income workers. But it's important to ensure that housing growth is balanced by local employment and transport opportunities to ensure that those second quintile renter households aren't forced into these long commutes. Strategic planning frameworks do seek to stimulate, do seek to stimulate new job creation in central areas of satellite cities, improve local transport connectivity, and also diversify housing options. Existing anchor institutions, medical facilities and universities, such as Deakin University's Future Economy Precinct at the Warren Ponds campus in Geelong, provide a strong basis for establishing new knowledge industry clusters, while relatively lower cost housing markets are also an incentive for firms and employees to relocate from metropolitan areas. Lifestyle and amenity benefits offer competitive advantages, and certainly in our interviews with Satellite City local government officers, this was stressed. They talked about how they um, marketed and discussed with potential firms relocating to their areas how they talked about like these lifestyle and amenity benefits. However, these cities do have high car dependency, 
and there's certainly a risk that any new residential release areas will be poorly served by public transport, which actually undermines affordable living objectives. And there were some wonderful quotes in our interviews about this, um, that, because local government officers were really aware of it. Um, and finally, the Geelong City deal does represent an important opportunity to catalyse local jobs and investment in the CBD of Geelong, but also on a more regional basis. A similar strategic funding intervention in Wollongong would support ongoing efforts to diversify the local and regional economy in Illawarra Shoalhaven. Um, that is definitely enough for me. I hope um, I hope everyone's still awake. And I, with great pleasure, I'm going to pass over to Nicole, who's just going to talk now about the third and final stage of our research. Thanks, Madeline. Katarina, add the next slide, please. So Madeline's given you just a taster, actually, of a rich body of findings in the report. So please do download it. It's my job to just pull it together in terms of some of the policy levers uh, that we identify in the report and some potential directions to addressing the, the housing supply job mismatch as a basis really to inform the, com the bigger conversation that we're going to have um, through the Q&A session. So both through the interviews and also our spatial analysis, we did identify some potential levers even that wouldn't require a great deal of funding to increase the supply of, of housing that's both affordable, but also available to low income renter households. And that available word is something that's really critical. As I said at the outset, this project was informed by a series of projects and nestled within a bigger inquiry that we undertook for Uhuri and work by Kath Hulse and others, which is already available on the Uhuri website, really forensically demonstrated that over a 20 year period, four census periods, there has been an increasing decline in the overall supply of rental housing that's affordable to that Q2 uh, renter household cohort. But not only that overall supply, more worryingly actually, the, um, the availability of that housing because as we've had squeezes across the rental market, and we know renting actually has grown as part of our housing system, but that's created squeezes at the bottom, a particular squeeze for housing for rental housing that's affordable for people on very low incomes and that net shortage has flow on repercussions across the rental market and it means that even if in um, in numerical terms there might be a sufficient quantity of supply affordable to Q2 it's not available because it's being occupied by people on very low incomes or moderate income earners as well who are also uh, facing um, competition and unable often to enter home ownership. So our analysis looked at markets where theoretically you're able to supply even in the market rental housing that's affordable to low income workers putting aside the question of availability and then compared that in relation to accessibility to jobs and we did find some areas where if you could do something around availability increase the supply and also make sure that it was available to that target cohort where you could actually make quite a significant difference without, um, without the need for a lot of additional funding. Policy intervention, less funding. Of course, there's those complementary strategies around addressing affordable home ownership and um, the supply of social rental housing as well. But the other um, two pieces in the puzzle, if you like, are making sure that when we do prioritise strategic transport infrastructure to connect areas where housing may be relatively more affordable. It's often more affordable because those are, areas are inaccessible, making sure that we then take account of the potential housing market impacts of those interventions. And then the third aspect, looking at the potential role of places like satellite cities, where yes, there's existing affordable rental housing, but where the policy challenge based on the interviews and, and um, particularly what our um, key informants told us in those satellite cities was not so much about connecting 
the um, the residents of those cities connecting the workers between the major cities, but more talking about how to catalyse job growth in areas and clusters, actually, of, of job growth, particularly around um, anchor institutions like universities, how you can create employment around areas where housing is currently affordable. Uh, next slide, please, Katarina. So this is the kind of map that I'm sure people on the, um, on the webinar are really familiar with, but it's that inverse relationship between the location of affordable rental housing and the location of jobs, which I'll show you in a moment. And this map is just showing in crude terms where the rental housing is at a medium level that's affordable to the top end of low income rental households, so up to $355 a week. Of course, we know, those of you who are from Sydney, know that actually there's not very much rental stock there anyway, even if it's technically affordable, there's not very much of it. But as I'll show you in a moment, it's also um, very far away from job opportunities. But the light green map actually for people who are familiar with Sydney shows actually some area for opportunity because those are areas that are just 20% unaffordable to those um, renter households. And where the issue is just as much around availability, are they able to access rental housing that's being provided in the market? Um, because they're often not able to access it if we can use interventions to guarantee access. And also things such as the density bonus that's available in New South Wales for affordable rental infill housing that can just bring in that new rental supply at a 20% market discount, for instance, match it up to households who are in need. Actually, the problem doesn't look as, as difficult um, for this cohort as you know we might um, as we might typically. Um, think. Katarina, next slide please. This is just showing the employment density and when we match those two things up mm -hmm. we can see yes we've got high employment density in those areas that we know, the central city areas that are well serviced by public transport. In those areas the only option is to subsidise affordable rental housing for those workers who need to be near those areas. But in those middle ring areas where I just showed you the market is not very far off being able to deliver an affordable rental product, but the supply response that we've had over the past six years hasn't taken us there. We do need intervention to make sure that those target households are able to access it, but it's not a lot of intervention and we'll be able to make a difference. Next slide, please, Katarina. Just looking at Melbourne, the situation is actually, it's similar. To Sydney in as much as the most of the areas that are most affordable are the furthest away from the jobs and also actually have the least availability. You know, there's not a lot of rental stock there. Um, but again, the middle ring um, areas is offering almost um, an affordable rental outcome and the issues being lack of availability um, for that particular cohort. Next slide please, Katarina. The employment density is actually more dispersed in Greater Melbourne, again showing that some small tweaks um, because the geography of jobs in Melbourne does tend to be a little bit more spread out, some more tweaks in, in the rental market would actually make quite a difference for that uh, Q2 renter household. Next slide please, Katarina. So um, now I'm just going to widen our lens entirely um, and go back to some of our general findings across the, across the project. And the first is just a summary of, of, of points around what place-based funding deals need to, um, need to exhibit. And in this list, we're actually not so much drawing on the Australian practice, which is too new. This is a list that Madeline, um, you know, road tested with our Australian informants through the interviews, but very much was the sorts of things that people in the UK were saying, you know, these are the things that we did wrong, these are the things that you should make sure your place-based funding interventions, our city deals um, in Australia, these are the things that we need to check off. And those are around having defined aims and objectives that are underpinned by a really sound and contestable evidence base. 
making sure that even when the deals aren't ostensibly directed towards affordable rental housing mm. supply, making sure that we're alert to the market impacts, mm. the housing market impacts of infrastructure and other investments in, in space. They're going to have a market impact, which is generally a very, very welcome outcome. The only problem is that it can make it more difficult to secure affordable rental housing, to deliver affordable rental housing, unless we embed that into our planning at the start and we make sure we've got measures in place to uh, preserve affordability and to produce it in certain contexts as well. Those governance structures, critically important, public consultation, critically important, defined implementation arrangements, and they're making sure that they are well integrated with local planning processes and decision-making processes. That's difficult, but essential, obviously. Achievable timeframes and defined funding arrangements as well, and meaningful performance measures, um, review processes, and as I said, the specific levers are really critical when it comes to affordable rental housing. Next slide, please, Katarina. And so to get at that nitty gritty of how we might start to address the spatial mismatch, the first one is looking at the ways that we can just support the market that's almost there. That 20% uh, rental discount combined with an eligibility requirement, and we've got a scheme up and running in Sydney that, um, that does show that in those middle ring areas, Liverpool, Blacktown areas that are densifying a, a density bonus, that supports an affordable rental outcome can actually address the needs of those uh, low income renter households. But in areas that are benefiting from a more substantial uh, public investment in transport or other infrastructure, there is a significant opportunity to actually make an inclusionary housing requirement, for instance, there's an opportunity for some value capture that might support um, a flow of resources or land for affordable rental housing, potentially even some experimentation around affordable um, home ownership as well, but very much matching the opportunities to the particular housing market. And then uh, looking at the city deal model, for instance, in places like Geelong and already demonstrated in Wollongong to look at how you can encourage jobs creation as well around areas that are already affordable, but making sure that we look at connectivity both to the major employment centres in the CBDs of Sydney, Melbourne, our capital cities, but also internal uh, connectivity within those areas in which we want to encourage new employment clusters. And I mean, Western Sydney obviously would be another place in which we would talk about what, how that city deal mechanism is able to catalyse both connectivity to capital city employment and economic uh, connections, but also internal connectivity to support jobs in areas where housing might already be affordable, so long as we're able to preserve that affordability. And last slide, please, Katarina. So the takeaways from the, the project are certainly around place-based deals and we scratched hard and we actually didn't find negativity around place-based deals, which is mm. unusual. Mm. You usually mm. do when you go and interview mm. uh, the number of people mm. that we interviewed in this project, we didn't mm. find negativity. Actually, there's a mm. great deal of mm. optimism around the potential mm. for these mm. bespoke places to get at mm. the particular um, place-based opportunities, but also challenges. Um, and to use them as an opportunity to reconfigure that relationship, really difficult relationship between the location of employment opportunities and rental housing. The potential role for satellite cities, which we're certainly um, actually seeing more um, potential around, mm. um, around reconfiguring both the relationship between traditional CBDs and jobs, but also the potential opportunity for satellite cities to, um, to play a bigger role. Um, and the need to make sure that in doing that, it's not about conceiving those places, dormitory communities, but mm -hmm. as self-contained employment centres with opportunities. 
But at the end of the day, you know, we can talk all we like, but we need to make sure that specific mechanisms are in place when we're talking about affordable rental housing, because otherwise, if we get infrastructure right, if we get our urban planning and design right, unfortunately, the market will, um, will make those areas unaffordable unless we're able to put in place specific mechanisms to guarantee access and affordability for low income rental households. And I'll leave it there, <laughs> open to questions. I think that's our last slide, Katarina. Yes. I'd say so. <laughs> Look, that brings us to the, the Q&A session. And thank you both for that, for that really interesting presentation. Um, a lot to cover in, in, in all of that research. Um, we're getting a few questions starting to come through um, through the, the the question panel of the of the um, go to webinars app. Please feel free to put your questions through. I might just start with with one question, which I guess is is a detail about the research project and some of the findings. And that was whether or not the research looked at um, whether particular particular sectors um, within the sort of Q2 renter houses whether employment opportunities were particularly targeted to any sectors particularly? Maybe I'll take that question, Michael, mm -hmm. because it really looks at the bigger inquiry. So mm -hmm. there's, there were four projects in the inquiry and one of the, the first project by Kath Hulse, which I mentioned, which looked nationally at the picture for Q2 renter households and was a longitudinal study, looked also at Q2 renter households by occupation. Just looking at uh, what they were doing in terms of their housing, how they were meeting their housing needs, whether they were trying, whether they were living unaffordably in order to be near particular jobs or whether um, they were potentially moving out of the workforce or whether they were enduring um, a, a spatial mismatch in terms of mm -hmm. just enduring a long commute, which was the focus of the second project uh, mm -hmm. Jag, led by Jago. And I don't think that's up on the Uhuri website yet. Kath Hulses certainly is. Jago's mm -hmm. may be, it will be any um, day soon. And then the other two projects, um, Madeline's project looked at, as I said, the uh, as we're gone through more the um, strategic policy interventions and um, the project led by Robin Dowling looked actually at the potential for digital innovation, smart cities, that whole sector, as well as the telecommunications support around connectivity, the potential for that um, actually to make a difference in this whole conversation. Now we in our project looked at the location when we did our employment density maps, we also looked at the density of particular types of jobs. But I couldn't off the top of my head mm -hmm. tell you where the mismatches are worse between uh, the location of jobs and the location of affordable rental housing. And we didn't in the inquiry overall look at, aside from the tech jobs in the innovation sector, we weren't looking at particular types of strategies around particular jobs. Um, aside from knowing that there are some employment sectors that benefit from clustering. Mm -hmm. um, so some firms, and so therefore, you know, the, the firms that need clustering need particular types of jobs. Mm -hmm. And then there's other types of jobs, such as um, service industry jobs, retail jobs, et cetera, mm -hmm. that are always going to be wherever there is a concentration of jobs or population. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers the question, if the that answers the, question, but it did give me an opportunity to talk a little bit more widely about the inquiry. And I guess just to, to add to your, your comments there, the, the report by Robin Dowling, led by Robin Dowling that you mentioned will be uh, on the Uhuri website next week. Um, and then the one led by Jago Dodson in about a month's time, right at the very start of September. So they're, they're coming right. soon, but quite a pipeline of reports coming through over the mm. next, uh, next couple of months. And those will feature in it prominently. I've got a, a three-part question from Wendy Hayhurst um, that we might just take piece by piece because there's a bit of detail here. Um, so starting off, does does the research find productivity benefits um, arising from the availability of housing options for future households close to employment? Is that something that the inquiry addressed? Yep. We didn't Do address it. We didn't address it directly in this project but again it's an inquiry issue yeah 
in the wider research. Great. So that'll that'll be coming soon. Um, I mean, we could just say, Wendy, yeah. certainly um, in the wider inquiry and certainly the interviewees in this project emphasise the importance of, for the labour market, having access to affordable rental housing near work or otherwise, you know, the mm. precarity of businesses, you know, having a high churn in their um, in their employee base, for instance, you know, all of those types of issues were certainly raised, mm -hmm. even though they're not front and centre in this particular project. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Michael. Mm -hmm. Up to. And then building on that, I guess, taking particular interest in the in the French example that mm -hmm. that, that you looked at, mm -hmm. Madeline spoke mm -hmm. to, um, and and are there elements to the French model that would translate well to the Australian context? That's a great question, and I think I think it really gets to the point about having to think about um, governance arrangements. And obviously, what's powerful about the French model is how centralised power is in France, and how the national government can legislate that 25% of any new housing is required to be social housing, and they can um, provide the requisite funds to ensure delivery of that. Um, that's a really, really significant difference. Um, but, but certainly, um, I think as a mechanism, you because essentially it's still a deal. It's a deal between central government and these communes, in the, 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 these, these constituent small local government areas. And certainly, I mean, the, 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 the reading I did about this, it was fascinating because, of course, some communes did not want to participate and did not want to have a deal and did not want to have, um, you know, huge, um, as they saw it, dense transport orientated development within, within their areas. Having said that, I think what was really interesting in the analysis that's been undertaken, there's a paper by Gales that's really good, that's referenced in the report, and the reference, the full reference is in, is in the report on the URI website. It's a great read. But what was interesting is, of course, there was quite a lot of arm twisting. You know, when central government asks you to do something and they're offering funding and there's legislation backing it up, it's hard, very hard to say no. Um, and that's that's um, something that a lot of um, critiques of British city deals have said as well is you're 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 having to engage in deal making as a local government. But having said that, what, what the paper revealed was that um, over time, look that these offices in these local governments um, in the Greater Paris region really did find process benefits to being engaged. And they found that it empowered them in other aspects of planning, it empowered them in place making and so on. So some of the communes that were initially sceptical, that kind of were unwilling participants, actually got much more on board during the process. Um, so again, I think there probably are so there are, there are a multitude of lessons here for how we go about um, arranging multi-level governance arrangements, which is essentially what these deals are, whoever the parties are that end up being um, part of these of these deals. But sorry, that was a very rambling answer. Um, I hope I hope that was of some interest. I think so. Um, and then the final part of, of, of Wendy's Wendy's series, and then we'll give others a go. Um, commenting that, that value capture is often used in in um, in arguing for transport investment, how do we how do we convince key officials to get housing up in the priority list in, in mm. those sorts of arguments? Mm. Look, I mean, there's different ways to talk about value capture, and we'll resist mm. that unless there's some more questions about it, in which we can get into the nitty gritty. Mm. But I think there's, I'll go back to what I said before. When we invest in infrastructure or when we make, you know, significant even public planning decisions to rezone an area, for instance, we know and we want the value of the land to increase because that's what catalyzes development, you know, so we want that to happen. And that's a good outcome for everything except for providing non-profit housing. Mm. And so we either need to slice off 
that value or embed it before the value is created. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just nonsensical to mm -hmm. go out and bid on a market that through a public planning or investment decision we have actually inflated to then go out and try and provide a non-profit generally a non-profit or at least a reduced profit housing outcome. So I think that's the way that we need to think about it. Whatever mm -hmm. you think about value capture, if we, for instance, had to pay for roads or, um, or parks after we'd already invested um, in the infrastructure and the zoning that made that land, you know, mm -hmm. commercially attractive, you'd be crazy. You know, we wouldn't have any mm -hmm. of those things. So that's how we need to think about affordable housing is just that we can't afford to do it after we've invested in an area unless mm -hmm. we've worked out how we're going to provide it and that's either mm -hmm. requiring it at the start or it's signalling um, that mm -hmm. there will be a value capture arrangement mm -hmm. to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Maybe a mixture of those things depending on which sector of mm -hmm. the housing needs continuum mm -hmm. and we should be actually addressing all of them. We're, um, we're looking um, to mm. address. Can I just say one more thing though, and that isn't that we can fund social housing by mm. the value uplift around, mm. you know, the <laughs> Western City deal, for instance, absolutely mm. not, you know, or even a light rail or anything. This is not a way to fund social housing, mm. but that it's a way to secure land, it's a way to secure development opportunities, and if there's significant value being created, we just want to make sure that that's not making it more difficult to produce affordable housing. Mm. It should be making mm. it easy. That's probably enough of a rave from me on that one. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to return to, to what Q2 households are. There are a number of questions um, keen to understand that a little bit more. Um, and, and, you know, I know it's not the purpose of this research to define a Q2 household, but I guess just to give the the participants in the webinar, just a bit more of a sense of who we're talking about, whether they're typically full-time workers or part-time or casualised work, um, what sort of sectors are involved. And I know there's other research that has looked at mm -hmm. it in detail. Yeah. To what extent does this research connect that, that line of thinking to the City Deals approach? Yeah, um, so Kath Holtz's report, which luckily is available on the mm -hmm. net, was basically our reference for this study. So mm -hmm. they, Kath and her team, basically categorised the Q2 households into a whole lot of different employment scenarios, mm -hmm. ranging from, you know, double income, but they're obviously low paid incomes, mm -hmm. um, seeking trying to seek additional work, mm -hmm. um, actually not participating in the workforce mm -hmm. at all, only one person mm -hmm. in the workforce, single parent households. So a whole range of different um, compositions actually of that Q2 rent a household. Mm -hmm. And we were informed by that in terms of, of our analysis. So was Jago uh, Dodson in their report though, to a lesser degree. So in terms of, then when you come at this from much more, you know, we zoom out. So that's a real zooming in exercise actually is mm -hmm. to understand that particular segment, which includes renters, it includes low income workers who are absolutely connected and fundamental to the, the, the functioning of firms in the CBD and mm -hmm. also essential services throughout the city. Um, but it also includes people who actually aren't very, it includes renter households who actually aren't very connected in, um, in the employment market for whatever reason, we weren't able to get into that. And it also included some households that actually don't need to be in the central city either. So that's the nitty gritty. Now, if we zoom out and think about the strategic end of something like a city deal, the Western City deal, which is really trying to connect Western Sydney mm. and to catalyse job growth in an area where, you know, we would traditionally say, well, that would be a more affordable home ownership mm. market and rental market, although that is a ridiculous oversimplification mm. of Western mm. Sydney. Also happens mm. to be um, the area where we're concentrating our new mm. housing supply opportunities mm. as well to a large mm. degree, not only. Mm to a large degree. So that's a really big picture and it's really difficult to connect those two things. But mm -hmm. we can say that uh, that um, Q2 
renter households who are trying to access employment opportunities are overrepresented in Western Sydney and in many parts of Western Sydney they are underserved by access to jobs. Mm -hmm. So whatever mechanism we do via the Western, via Western um, Sydney City deal or other planning interventions should be trying to do several things. One, internal connectivity. Two, mm -hmm. supporting job growth. But three, just making sure that affordable rental housing is thought about as part of the constellation of um, mm -hmm. you know, planning decisions and policy interventions. And that's going to be a place by place. Mm -hmm. it is mm -hmm. It's not as though it's not happening either. I mean, in Liverpool, for instance, the density bonus that um, is available under the affordable rental housing set is actually producing probably nowhere near enough, but it's actually producing a pipeline of 20% market discount rental housing that is going to community housing providers and they are then providing that to Q2 households essentially. Mm -hmm. Essentially, That type of thing needs to be scaled up, but mm -hmm. you know, it, it is happening. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a couple of questions that I'm going to draw into a theme, I guess, and one of which is, is what are the implications of this research for the regional deals that, that operate mm. as almost a parallel stream in this country? And I guess paired with that, there's another, there are a couple of questions that talk about, is there a, an optimal scale for this? Because the size of some of these city deals have, have been mm. quite variable. Mm. Um, you know, the, 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 great, the Western Sydney deal is probably mm. larger in geographic areas mm. than, than most, although South East Queensland's mm. certainly right up there. Mm. But some of them are quite small by comparison mm. in terms of the mm. geographic spread. Mm. What difference does that make? Mm. So, a question for Madeline, I think, to start with. Uh, I mean, that's that's something that is really striking to me. Is if you just do a really basic comparison, and actually, interestingly, on time frames as well, and um, the, the 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 Australian, the kind of I think there's you know over 30 UK city deals for, for, for better or worse. Um, but the average time scale in the UK is kind of 20 to 30 years. Whereas here, I did work it out with the nine city deals, but it's a much shorter average time scale. I think it's like five to 10 years. And, and I think that's indicative both of them being smaller scale um, more focused, more specifically place targeted with a specific aspect of infrastructure. I think, you know, Western Sydney City De Deal, which is the one I'm most familiar with, is certainly much more diffuse than that, but a lot of the others, Launceston and, and so on, a lot of the others are much more a particular piece of infrastructure based. And they don't have the, the, the requisite time frame which you think would be necessary to really give the participants confidence that they've got time to really develop the relationships to then establish the requisite formalised governance and then to deliver being able to give partners certainty that that commitment's going to remain. So that's not really answering the question, but I think it's really noteworthy to me. And I'm still trying to sort of unpick a little bit, kind of, I guess, more theoretically, because I think ultimately it goes back to what is the purpose of these deals, and and we're hamstrung here by the sort of Oscar Wilde that you know it's 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 it, it, it's the same I can't remember the quote between British and American English you know but we're using the same language, but actually we're referring to different things and we, we, they happen to both be called city deals, um, and, and I'm sure we can have a really long discussion about what the actual priorities are. But in simple terms, it seems to me that there's obvious commonalities beyond the name, but one of the obvious differences is this government structuring. And to me, it's about the federal government being able to go straight to the local level, maybe via the state, you know, because they have to be involved, but it's about going into a local area and providing a particular particular piece of infrastructure. Other colleagues, I, you know, I was reading some work by Paul Burton, may mention the phrase port barrel um, in these discussions. I wouldn't be so bold. Um, certainly though in, in the UK, uh, that might be a pertinent um, thing to, 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 to mention as well. 
can I just add something, Michael? And it just has to be said that Australia's regions do need investment, and mm -hmm. I think there is a significant opportunity to catalyse job um, opportunities and clusters of job opportunities, and they will be different in terms of the mm -hmm. co particular competitive advantages of those regions. Mm -hmm. And obviously, we've got to at some point acknowledge the pandemic and the great changing in work behaviours that um, that are now occurring and the opportunities that that might mean for regional areas. But to take mm -hmm. advantage of those, they will need some significant mm -hmm. investment. Mm -hmm. And when we make that investment and when we look at the in economic opportunities that we hope that that will catalyse, we just have to remember that rental housing affordability and availability mm -hmm. is a problem in regional mm -hmm. Australia as well. Mm -hmm. And again, we can't generalise about the way that you address that in particular markets, but it's something that whenever we're investing in an area, we mm. also just need to pay attention to the specific housing needs and how we might address them. I'll just leave it at that. And I think that's a really, I mean, that's such the, the, the most important takeaway from today. And I think it's, you know, we get, and no city deal claims that its overriding priority is affordable housing provision. Absolutely, these are not explicitly an affordable housing tool, but we're kind of, we're, we're missing a trick here, given the transformative infrastructure, and this phrase is a phrase that everyone uses because these are the types of, um, projects that city deals in all their shapes and forms tend to hinge on, we're missing a trick by not ensuring that it's really thinking through the housing market implications and concomitantly the urban productivity implications of, of, of these, these transformative um, projects. One of the, one of the more provocative suggestions that's come in that, that perhaps Madeline, I'll, I'll turn into a question about international practice and, and whether there are other examples in elsewhere or, or perhaps in Australian city deals that have done this, but has the approach been taken anywhere that um, some people who no longer need to live in, in areas that are, that are sort of employment intensive because they're retired or they're able to work from home have been relocated to other places to, to free up that housing in, in inner areas? Oh, shouldn't that be amazing? I mean, um, not that I know of. I mean, obviously, you can talk about kind of, in, you know, the kind of the, in the US, the, the sort of escape to Florida of the, of the retirees. So, again, I mean, some of these discussions take on a whole new light right now, don't they? Because I think the the, the attractiveness of what perhaps we, we think of as the sleepier or the, the satellite cities or the places you go to retire, these are getting these are getting attractive for major metro areas and I mean again I've, I've only been I arrived in I've been living in Sheffield here in the UK since January so it's been a rather odd introduction to the city because I've been in lockdown since March but actually you know, anecdotal evidence is that there are a lot of people who are cash buyers from London and the house market here has gone up by I think it's estimated 10-12% um, over May um, so the, 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 the appetite for where people want to live at what, what life stage, now perhaps we're, we're working for home seems to be a more viable option that employees, employers are encouraging, um, or some employers seem to be encouraging and realizing the costs of these expensive um, central London offices and so on is really fascinating. But that's not to the question. I think in terms of the question, I'm afraid I'm not aware of any explicit um, policies in that regard. So I think it would be. I'm going to say something there. <laughs> I can't let that opportunity slip without um, referring to the issue that has bugged planners, you know, for all time, and that is that households don't match the housing that they live in. Because in a housing market, the more mm. you can afford to consume, the more you will. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't matter who you are, if you can afford to live in a big house mm -hmm. in a well-located area, whether or not you're mm -hmm. working nearby, that's mm -hmm. where you want to work, you will. And we can't really mm -hmm. do much about that. Mm -hmm. But what we can do something about is international tourists consuming mm -hmm. our 
permanent mm -hmm. housing. And it's no surprise mm -hmm. that the areas that are best located in relation to jobs and transport in Sydney and Melbourne are also a perfect match for our Airbnb um, mm -hmm. rental, you know, short-term mm -hmm. rental accommodation. And in, in, in Australia, we haven't really done anything about that. We've mm -hmm. allowed new housing units to come on. Mm -hmm. um, they haven't addressed affordability. And part of that, small part, part of it mm -hmm. is actually leakage to the, you know, short-term rental market, particularly mm -hmm. um, in high value central city location. Mm. So yeah, a little bit of, of um, a little bit more intervention, I think is probably mm. warranted on mm. that front. And certainly Barcelona in terms of um, how it's actively regulated and now since COVID um, started repossessing vacant uh, rental property or vacant Airbnb properties is, you know, that, that there's, there's some radical policy choices that, that mm. could be made in that regard. But no city deals with a with a forced resettlement of retirees at this stage. No, <laughs> um, or I mean, though it is interesting. I think I think, I think I think that that retiree kind of cliche set of, beha of behaviours is I think is being modelled lower down lower down the, uh, the, the the age scale now. I will see whether the, how how deep and long those effects will will be interesting to see. Hmm. I guess a related question is is looking at you know to what extent can can city deals for satellite cities prevent gentrification of those cities prevent you know excessive price hikes within those cities um i, I don't know madeline do you want to to um, start with is, is there I mean, a role there it, yeah i yes. mean i guess yeah because i think Particularly, city deals don't happen without them being associated with something, and it tends to be major transport infrastructure. So, therefore, there are, there are very likely to be issues of displacement and gentrification associated with whatever the city deal, the, the key project that's hinging this, whether it's an airport or a sports stadium or a, or a major um, rail link or whatever it is, there's inherent dangers of, of um, uh, displacement and gentrification. And as Nicole has said, um, we need to think about building in measures in advance that mitigate that or prevent it, whether that be, um, as Nicole was saying, in her sort of value, value capture kind of discussion, how do, how do we preempt that? And as part of the city deal, as part of the deal making process, there needs to be proper contestable evidence base, seeking to model where these impacts are going to be and seeking to redress these with concerted deep and direct sensitivity of social housing or and all the other wonderful things that, that, that should happen. Mm. I mean, the, the South Australian example is a really good um, approach mm. for anyone who's really nervous about value capture, because essentially it, you know, in 2005, they said 15% New housing needs to be affordable, make it happen, it was introduced at a point at which the market was producing affordable house and land packages. And so that pipeline has continued for home ownership and um, is also the, the, the products are also made available um, to community housing providers as well to purchase mm -hmm. at that um, lower mm -hmm. cost price. Look, mm -hmm. it's not perfect. And I'm sure if we've got people from South Australia, they could, you know, point out some flaws. But conceptually, that's the type mm -hmm. of thing that could work really well in a, mm -hmm. in a lower value market. And I say lower as in relative to, you know, Sydney or Melbourne. Mm -hmm. But in a lower value market where actually land values prior to the deal aren't very high, you just try and make sure that they, um, that, that you're preserving that affordability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, might, I might move then to a question that's come from, I think, South Australia. We're using an Adelaide example um, where uh, a formerly housing trust, what was at once housing trust suburb with, with older homes on quarter acre blocks and fruit trees and, and so on. Um, about to be about to be you know bulldozed in favour of 600 dwellings in a multi-storey you know smaller apartment formats, with an increased number of affordable housing dwellings in it, but with biodiversity lost. And, and so how do how do you balance the the employment and social isolation and, and mm -hmm. environmental impacts 
in, in thinking about these place-based deals? Possibly I mean, beyond uh, the scope of this project. It's certainly beyond this direct scope. Sorry, Madeline, I can see you're going to yeah, say no, something, but I'll just no, throw no, was, something I was, in. I was, I was, I was, my head was reeling. Sorry. Oh, yeah, no, I mean, we don't know that particular proposal, yeah. but actually the redevelopment of social housing, certainly the developments that I've encountered recently, generally show a very high standard of sustainability in terms of the design. Now, whether they're able to return, to enhance or return biodiversity mm -hmm. to the site, mm -hmm. um, is a good question, mm -hmm. but I imagine that the strategic planning framework, even putting aside the um, the city deal model, I think that would be something that mm -hmm. the planners would be looking at very closely mm -hmm. and checking mm -hmm. and looking at the landscaping, the planting, mm -hmm. the um, I don't know the roof gardens, mm -hmm. the potential for environmental offset. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that particular mm -hmm. project. Mm -hmm. uh, but generally, I don't think anyone mm -hmm. should be or needs mm -hmm. to advocate biodiversity mm -hmm. loss to mm -hmm. deliver a higher density housing outcome. I mean, a but, slightly um, unrelated caution on this would be, I mean, and this was more from the UK um, interviews and reading, but I think quite a few of um, my kind of expert UK informants were concerned that city deals and deal making were part and parcel of a shift and actually certainly the, the, the planning reforms that have been announced in the UK just this week kind of indicate this as well, um, which I won't, I won't go into, um, but essentially they were concerned about city deals um, potentially, or uh, city deals and, and associated planning changes as heralding a downgrading of um, planning is a profession and planning and good planning practice and I think they, they saw it in terms of um, infrastructure strategies and plans essentially becoming the driving force and I think as planners or people that, 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 that you know care about that focused on housing we need to sort of strongly advocate for the importance of proper place making through our plans and and your example that you've just given in south australia is a perfect example of that and the importance of having proper planning so city city deals is not a coherent policy it's a tool to make a deal to deliver certain things in a certain way but it needs to be complemented by and, and aligned with and um, proper um, committed strategic and, and and local planning, including mm. Yeah, I think that's right. And it's part of the wider point that, you know, I think we had in Australia a sort of a rhetoric that, you know, we may hear again, which is that, oh, the housing supply emergency is just so extreme that we don't have time to, mm. you know, do our proper strategic mm. planning or a proper environmental assessments and we may start to hear that type of rhetoric mm. around the need for economic growth for instance mm. and I think the evidence certainly um, the weight of Uhuri reports that have been produced show that simply producing new housing doesn't address an affordable mm. outcome mm. we need to consider affordability just as we mm. need to consider you know the sustainability of where housing is going and the environmental mm. impacts on particular mm. sites you know it's not mm. a it's not an either or so um, mm -hmm. keep engaging the person who's engaging on that particular project mm. keep engaging but but it's not um, it's not the truth that a higher density housing project inherently is going to mean a loss of biodiversity unless you're mm. talking about a, 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 a particular protected site or, or species mm. Mm -hmm. We've got several dozen questions coming through on, on I guess, um, wider housing, housing policy, urban policy issues out, kind of outside of the scope of both this, mm -hmm. this project and the wider inquiry around Commonwealth state agreements, the role of philanthropy, mm -hmm. low cost construction, mm -hmm. sustainable construction, mm -hmm. um, share housing, demand side subsidies versus supply mm -hmm. side subsidies, build to rent, developer mm -hmm. motivations and conduct, whole range of other topics there mm -hmm. um, that I wish we had time for. Um, 
but I would encourage the people asking those questions to explore the AHERI website for, for research that does mm. in fact speak to those topics. Mm. The, the last question I think we'll have time for today, though, I think is 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 a fitting focus for us to to, to wind up on, which is really around the impact of of the pandemic. Um, mm. The changing nature of employment that that's triggering in terms of increased unemployment and underemployment mm -hmm. um, or reduced salaries um, and the impact of all of, 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 of shutdowns and, and gradual restarts and so on that we're going to see across the country at different times um, across the world, which is, it must be about 2am in Sheffield now um, or later. Um, you know, what sort of impact will that have on, on both increasing level sort of environments and, and mm. sense of community and, and, and housing outcomes. What sort of impact for city deals does that look like? Mm. Well, I mean, th there's a lot of different ways to answer that question. I think um, going to city deals sp specifically um, as, a, as a policy um, and in political rhetoric, it's obviously not been getting a lot of attention. Um, most recently, um, pre-COVID-19, uh, uh, with Johnson's um, kind of affirmation as RPM in December with the general election, and given the um, kind of red wall being surmounted um, in the north of uh, in the north of England, i.e., long-standing Labour perceived Labour strongholds becoming voting Conservative. Um, there, what there, this was followed by a flurry of discussion about levelling up, and I think that brought city deals to the fore again in terms of notions of the Northern Powerhouse and the and and these kind of um, rebalancing economic um, uh, opportunity and productivity kind of discussions. Again, all that's kind of very much in abeyance now. I think what's really interesting with the pandemic is you're really starting to see the central local relations, the governmental relations start to play out and the importance of local determination and the use of local knowledge in managing these kind of issues. And of course, also you're seeing beyond the kind of city deal, kind of urban policy levelling out rhetoric, you're really seeing an affirmation of the importance of quality place making quality precinct planning access to open space and you're seeing some of the equity you know the inequities of the, where people are living their ability to work from home or not um etc so the, the, there's so many things happening at the moment and i'm sure that the same in australia i think in, from the lens of this research it will be interesting in terms of the decentralization uh, opportunities or the, the change in attitudes that may may arise from this. Uh, certainly, in terms of Robin Dallin's report, particularly, we're thinking about like work live arrangements and that kind of thing, and that was part of that research. But are we really thinking through what that actually means in terms of, uh, for example, um, gender inequities and so on? So there's there's lots of different aspects we could talk about here, and I better hand over to Nicole. Oh, um, we're probably at time, aren't we, Michael? We are. Look, let, just, let, just I'll just say, OK, then. I, I don't know what form government intervention is going to come in the future and what it's going to be called, but we know that in the pandemic and post-pandemic mm. period, any investment that's designed to catalyse infrastructure and jobs is going to be so critically important. In making that investment, we want to be attentive to place and regions in a way that we haven't been. We just started to be, and I think it's really critical that we don't lose sight of that um, moving forward. Um, and secondly, I think there's going to be an assumption that housing problems have resolved on the one hand, because we probably will see lower rents, we'll see increased mm -hmm. vacancies, and we'll also mm -hmm. see um, We'll also see, I think, a demand to stimulate demand for the um, purpose of construction. We need to be very clear headed about that. People's housing problems are going to get worse, particularly 
this group that we looked at in this mm. inquiry, low income renters who are the most precarious, but also mm. really critical in the workforce, their housing, uh, the way that they meet their housing needs are like, is likely to be more concerning in terms mm. of a risk of overcrowding and so mm. on. And so when we are looking at stimulus, looking at government intervention, we need to pay attention to place, but I think we also need mm. to pay attention to the need for affordable rental housing. Mm. Um, and that's probably, everyone knew that to start with, but <laughs> we've got a whole lot of research that backs us up once more to say how- And plenty more to come, is. and plenty more to come. So, so look, I'm, I'm afraid time has beaten us again, and we've, we've reached the end of our time slot um, for this webinar. I really want to thank you both, Madeline and, and Nicole, for, for your presentation and thoughtful comments um, this morning or very early morning for you, Madeline. Um, let me acknowledge once more the generous sponsor of this, this webinar, the Housing Industry Association. Thank you. Um, our next webinar is coming up in a couple of weeks. The official invitation will be arriving in all your inboxes this afternoon. And in fact, registrations are, are now open on the Ahuri website. So please join me on, on Wednesday the 19th of August at 1pm uh, Melbourne time, where we'll be joined by Professor Christy Muir, the CEO of the Centre for Social Impact at the University of New South Wales, who present findings from the final report in the Uhuri Inquiry into Social Housing Pathways in Australia. And a quick reminder that we would really appreciate your feedback by completing the short survey that will land in your inbox shortly. Um, and if you want to share this webinar or look back at the slides, it'll be on our website in the coming days. And until we see you again, hopefully in person rather than just on screen, thank you for joining us today.